Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you here to our public lecture and series for 2018. And this is our event during Stroke Week in Sydney. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered here this morning, the Gadigal people of the Uru Nation, and pay my personal respects to elders past and present, and elders from many other communities who may be with us here this morning. My name is Sharon McGowan, and I'm the CEO of the Stroke Foundation. I have the best job in the world. I work with an amazing team who are really dedicated to improving stroke in Australia. And that's one of the key messages that we have for Stroke Week this year is that up to 80%, and in fact over 80% of strokes can be prevented. So we really, really want to get the message out to the Australian community that there's more that we can do to adopt a healthy lifestyle and reduce the impact of stroke in this country. To give you a few salient facts around stroke, for those of you that may not have a background in stroke or some personal experience, a stroke will happen every nine minutes in Australia. It remains Australia's third biggest killer and is the leading cause of adult disability. One of the other things that you might hear about this week is stroke happening in children. A stroke can actually impact anyone of any age. So a stroke is an attack on your brain, and that attack can happen to a baby in the womb, it can happen to a child at school, it can happen to a person at work. And one of the key things that you need to remember is that if it happens to someone in front of you, whether that's a child, a sibling, a friend, a colleague, your mum or dad, to know the fast signs, and that's the signs of a stroke. Because the quicker we get people to hospital, the quicker we can treat stroke and actually get better patient outcomes. So the fast message has always been that platform and message that we try to get out to the community. In Australia, we have a very big country, a very dispersed population, and minutes count when you've had a stroke. So let's just go through the fast message. So F is for face, has their face drooped, a is for arms, can they lift both arms? S is for speech, is their speech slurred, can they understand you? And T is time to call triple zero. Every stroke is a medical emergency, <coughs> minutes count, and for every minute that blood, is blood supply is interrupted to the brain, brain cells are dying at a rate of up to 1.9 billion a minute. I don't know about you, but I don't think I can lose that many brain cells every minute. So it's really, really important that we call triple zero and we get patients to hospital in time. So if you see any of those signs, call triple zero, that's the best way to get the best outcome for patients in this country, so that stroke is not the big impact that it is at the moment. So part of this morning is actually telling us a bit more about stroke, and we have a wonderful panel. This is our brain collective for this morning. Now, for those of you, who has listened to our Enable Me podcast? So you'll be very familiar with the voice of our MC here this morning, Chris Classic, who actually MCs and organizes all of our podcasts. So hey, Chris is actually going to introduce you to our wonderful panel of speakers. And we're absolutely thrilled particularly to have a consumer on our panel, uh, Brenda, who Chris will introduce formally. But it's really important, I think, that we share the personal experience of stroke as well as what needs to happen in stroke in the future to improve outcomes in this country. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Chris to introduce our panel. And I just wanted to say thank you for making the time to be with us this morning. It's such an important message to get out to the community. Our five healthy tips for a healthy lifestyle to reduce your risk of stroke. So please take this with you and share it with your friends and family and share the fast message. The more people that we um, know across the, across the country that know the fast signs, the more people will be treated and the better outcomes will be for patients. So thank you for being with us this morning and enjoy the Brain Collective. Thank you very much, Sharon. And thank you again to all of you for coming here today. Uh, as Sharon said, uh, one of the things that's very quick this year is the, the five steps to, uh, the steps to a healthy life. And I like to think that you all being here today and um, building stroke awareness is, is a good step to help your life, everybody. Um, also, stroke obviously is about the brain. Yes, we do have our brain collective. Um, the brain is extremely important, and so we want to express that by having three brains instead of just one. I think something we could probably all benefit from if we could. Uh, and I, my pleasure to introduce him now. Um, the first member of the, the brain collective here on my, on my left is Brenda Booth. 
Uh, now, Brenda has very little knowledge of the impact of stroke, as Sharon said. She is a stroke survivor herself. Uh, now, Brenda was a registered nurse at both public and private hospitals previously and has been a case manager with the New South Wales Disability Service, is that correct? Uh, in 2001, she did have a stroke caused by a tear in an artery in her neck, which initially affected her speech, sight, and arm movement. And she has recovered a lot physically, but she occasionally has less visible impacts like speech and fatigue. Uh, she continues to work in the disability sector with the NDIS. Uh, she's a former member of the Stroke Foundation's Consumer Council, and she continues to build stroke awareness and advocacy. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Brenda. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, next, next to her we have uh, Dr. Andrew Bivard. Is that correct? Yep. yep. Uh, he was a stroke researcher at the Royal Melbourne Hospital uh, and conjoint senior lecturer at the University of Newcastle. Uh, now, much of Andrew's work is on acute ischemic stroke using techniques like CT perfusion imaging to determine the size of the stroke in the brain and to work out which patients are going to be suitable for clot busting treatment. Um, this has led into a pivotal trial on a new drug connectoplase. Now, his research has earned him awards such as Young Investigator of the Year at the European Stroke Conference and the Peter Bladen Award from the Stroke Society of Australasia. Andrew, thank you for joining us. And last but not least, we have Caleb, Dr. Caleb Ferguson, who is a researcher at the Western Sydney University and Midwifery, Midwifery? Midwifery, yeah. Midwifery Research Centre and the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, Caleb is also a registered nurse with over a decade of clinical experience in acute stroke management. He is a member of working groups for the Stroke Foundation's Acute Stroke Management Guidelines and the Heart Foundation's Atrial Fibrillation Guidelines, and he's also a Stroke Safe Ambassador and raises money for the Stroke Foundation. Welcome to the panel, Caleb. Thank you. Now, we have a lot of areas of stroke to cover, uh, but I want to look back at some of the things in the past and how things have changed over recent years. Now, Brenda, as I mentioned, you have a long experience with the health system, mm -hmm. um, from uh, your nursing background to working in the disability sector and as well as obviously with your own stroke. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us, give us a bit of an idea of what changes that you've observed in the, in the um, treatment of stroke and also the way we treat people who've had strokes in the last 20 or so years? Okay. Um, um, because I am a stroke survivor, I need my notes just to jog my memory, so I hope you don't mind. Um, look, when I was nursing um, back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, um, back then there was not very much done. I actually worked on a neurology ward, and um, when a person had a stroke, um, they came into the ward, and, and really um, they either recovered or, or they didn't. And even a professor I've had contact with after then pretty much said the same thing. And so um, have things moved forward, absolutely. You know, um, when I had so my, my stroke was um, 17 years ago, and um, I went to a hospital that uh, it was before the days of stroke units, but it was at, like the ward I went to had the prelude to a stroke unit. And um, so I had my stroke and then I started having multiple TIAs. And because of the close observation that I got at the time, I actually have felt strongly the difference between me actually going on to have a, a, a permanent disability. So, and so the changes are that shortly thereafter in about 2000, um, 2000 sorry, 2002, the government funded stroke units. So stroke units came along, and, um, and, and stroke units are such an important part of, um, you know, treating stroke and, and helping people uh, reduce their disability. Um, the other thing that happened in the early 2000s was the Stroke Foundation had their first Stroke um, Foundation guidelines. So it was um, a, an opportunity to um, provide clinicians with the best practice of care. So this was the very first guidelines. Um, um, and um, looking at my notes. Um, and then the other thing, stroke started to be treat, treated as a medical emergency. So that people did get seen rapidly and in, in emergency department and, and hopefully they were offered the, the best option for treatment. Um, uh, the clock-busting drug from Relysis came along in the last 20 years. 
um, uh, block retrieval it has been happening in the last five or six years. The FAST campaign, it's not as much as it should be, but there is growing awareness about the FAST campaign. There's more research into stroke. Um, telemedicine is starting to become a big thing. Um, and then most likely the, the latest thing is the stroke ambulance in Victoria. So all of those changes have occurred in, in the last 20 years, which is big. That, that is quite an amazing list here, when you think about how far we've come. Uh, now you did mention some things like uh, the clock busting thrombolysis and clock retrieval there. Um, Andrew, I might get you to expand on these a little bit, uh, because this is probably your one of your areas of expertise. And just explain to people who maybe not familiar with what some of these these amazing developments are, but also how things like the uh, the diagnostic imaging technology that you work on is helping with these sort of treatments. Yeah, it's a big question. Uh, that's, there's a lot of parts there. Um, so <clears throat> when a patient comes to hospital with a stroke, the first line of care is to assess them to make sure they actually do have a stroke and rule out mimics. And stroke is actually very difficult to diagnose. Um, clinically. So that's why you need some imaging to positively identify that there is brain that doesn't have enough blood flow to it because of a blood vessel occlusion. Uh, you can't assess that clinically. Like you can't just look at a person, do some assessments and say this is what's happening. Uh, so you really need that uh, brain imaging to go on. And so that's you know where my uh, research career started is doing that kind of brain imaging. <clears throat> uh, we inject the dye and, and just take a movie of the brain over 60 seconds, do some computing power and uh, we can measure the area of the brain that will die <coughs> and the area of the brain that is dead. Um, and that ratio to those two will be your treatment responsiveness. So there are people who come to hospital who have a lot of dead brain. And really, there's, there's nothing you can do for them because uh, it's, it's all gone. They've missed their window for treatment. Um, and we've shown that treatment of these people with clot-busting medication is harmful. Um, it will accelerate their decline. Um, so it's, you want to withhold treatment from them. Uh, and at the moment there's, there's one drug that's approved for stroke and it's called alteplase and this is what's called a tissue plasminogen activator. So it activates the body's ability to break down its own, its clots. Uh, it's, it's a very effective agent. Um, you give it as a bolus and then an infusion over an hour. It's, it's fairly quick, uh, it's fairly fast acting. It acts within uh, well, about an hour. Um, within that time frame, the clot should dissolve. Um, but its efficacy, it's not great. Uh, it's probably works about 40% of the time. Uh, but that was the first drug that came out. And at the moment, what's being tested is a newer drug. It's a genetic modification of this drug called tenecteplase. Uh, this one is very easy to administer. Just single ejection, off you go. Um, and it's very fast acting. It probably works within about 14 minutes. Um, and it's much more effective and it's much safer to give as well. So we're really hoping that this drug comes through in our clinical trials that are ongoing at the moment. Uh, one of those clinical trials did actually finish this year and was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, so we're hoping that we can change what drug uh, people get when they go to hospital. Um, but then uh, in 2015, um, thrombectomy was validated for stroke. Um, and what thrombectomy is, it's kind of a semi-surgical procedure where a radiologist or a neurologist uh, or a cardiologist can do this. They go in uh, with a wire through the groin up through the heart, through the lungs, back through the heart, up to the brain, pull out the clot, back all that way, and up they go. Um, and they're physically removing that clot. So this um, can only be done for some arteries in the brain that are, are occluded. And these arteries are called large vessels, this is because they're the bigger ones. Um, so these are targeting the patients who would do the worst. So these people with a large vessel occlusion are the ones who have the highest mortality rate, highest disability rate, decline the fastest. So any treatment option you can give them, especially one that's effective, is something that you want to do. Um, and just to give a, some gravity to how effective this treatment is, uh, I think three of the five clinical trials uh, that were done in 2015 of this technique uh, were stopped early because the safety committees for these trials said this therapy is so effective it is no longer ethical to give them placebo. We need to stop the trial and give it to them. And so that caused a huge uh, change within the whole the health system as they're trying to get all the cath labs and all the radiologists skilled up and get everything going. And so that's the state of play at the moment. But then this year, uh, what happened is two other clinical trials came in. So we, we heard at the start that uh, time is really important in stroke. You, we, we can only give the clot-busting drugs uh, 
alterplase or tenecteplase within four and a half or six hours. It, it's a little bit variable where you go, but that's a very tight time window. So you have six hours to get to the hospital to receive therapy, although the, the license for alterplase is only at four and a half, so that's a very short time window <coughs> to be picked up by an ambulance, to be delivered to a hospital, to be seen by a neurologist, to have the brain scans, to have those interpreted, to get the drug, to infuse it with the drug. Very tight. Uh, so there's been a lot of health system reform to try and speed up these processes. Uh, but what happened is that this year two trials came out to show that you can do thrombectomy out to 24 hours and it's, it's very effective. So that's blown open that treatment time window uh, from four and a half to six hours to 24. That, that is enormous. Um, and we're trying to scramble to try and adopt this uh, into the current guidelines and, and therapy for, the, uh, for all the hospitals that can do this thrombectomy procedure. But what was key to expanding this time window to 24 hours was the use of brain imaging again. So they selected patients who could only benefit, uh, who definitely had a large vessel occlusion, who had a lot of brain to salvage, and in those patients they had the most to gain. Uh, what's amazing looking at that data is that there wasn't a, a large number of patients who weren't eligible uh, because too much of brain had already died. So there was a fair bit of brain that can stay alive for 24 hours, and then you pull up the, the clot mechanically, and they do quite well. Uh, so this has profound implications. One is that it means that the advanced imaging that I've been researching for quite a, for eight years is now has to be standard of care. You need to assess people with this in order to, to deliver uh, the, the therapy. So that's thrombectomy or thrombolysis. Second is that people in uh, regional rural areas who are a very long way away, who can't be transferred very quickly, can now have access to these uh, to thrombectomy or to have the life as occlusion. But we've got to upgrade them with the imaging. And then we, we're trying to build the systems now to have remote viewing of the imaging. So a neurologist in a big hospital who has a lot of stroke patients, very skilled up in, in what a stroke is, how to interpret imaging, and view imaging from a centre a long, long, long way away. And uh, I'd say that in Australia, we, at the moment, uh, Victoria has the the Victorian telestroke system and at the moment they, they've achieved that and it's the first telehealth system in the world to have advanced multimodal imaging processed and centralised. So it's, it's working and hopefully we can expand that to the rest of the country. That is like said, an amazing list of, of uh, films that are going That's on. That's a lot, yeah. Big yeah, question. Is, is <laughs> uh, well, I do I will want to find out a bit more about uh, yeah, the systems and how they work in Australia. But first, I want to hook you, Kayla, because um, so the biggest impact you can have on stroke is by preventing people from having <coughs> strokes in the first place. Uh, now, I guess I'm interested in how is our approach to stroke prevention changing at the moment, or how has it changed over recent years? Because I know there's been increased attention on things like atrial fibrillation, which is one of your areas of expertise. How, how are we changing our approach to dealing with people preventing their strokes? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll talk very briefly about atrial fibrillation and because that's my area of expertise, particularly from a research perspective. And I think over the last probably five or ten years, we've seen quite a lot of um, developments in that area. And so AF, or atrial fibrillation, is whereby you have a clot formed in the, in the heart potentially and travel up through the neck vessels and be a cause of, of, of stroke when that blocks one of the large vessels within the brain. Um, so the issue there is, is there's a few issues with, with that. One, knowing that, that people have it in the first place, so screening and diagnosis for those patients is really important and sometimes that's very um, challenging for individuals because um, a lot of the risk factors for stroke sometimes are, are quite asymptomatic. So people are going around the, the daily life and they don't know that they have AF. They also might not know that they have hypertension or high blood pressure or diabetes as well. So all these things um, are sometimes quite asymptomatic and people don't know that they have them until they have the first stroke event. So there's a lot of work um, to be done in that area of, of screening and diagnosis from the primary prevention side of things. Um, with AF in, in particular, we've had the development and a lot of advancement in some of the new drugs that are available um, for stroke prevention in the setting of AF. Um, so now, now on the PBS we have three new drugs um, that are now recommended for stroke prevention in AF. And um, 
Recently, we just had the guidelines published um, from the Heart Foundation and the Cardiac Society, and they just launched um, in August this year. Um, and that's really sort of driven a lot of, sort of develop, the developments have really driven um, the, the need for these guidelines as well, which hopefully will, will have quite an impact on primary stroke prevention and secondary stroke prevention in particular. Um, but also, I guess, other models of care are, are quite interesting. So we've already kind of spoken about new developments in the way that we design and deliver our health systems. Um, and I think there's now quite a lot of evidence in terms of or building evidence anyway for newer models of, um, of preventative care as well. So um, for patients that have um, high um, cardiovascular risk in particular, um, to have multidisciplinary clinics um, that are supported by nurses and potentially led by nurses as well. And there's some good data, particularly from Europe and Canada in particular, um, that these models of care um, are really effective in reducing the, the impact um, of cardiovascular disease and improving mortality. Um, so that's really, I guess, those new models of care and along with screening and diagnosis um, are really sort of key in, in the atrial fibrillation world. I think um, from the preventative side of things as well, a lot of um, I've worked in the fact in pharmacy in the last couple of years as well. And pharmacies are really well placed in, in the community to deliver preventative care. And there's been a, quite a big shift in, in their role and function in some of the services that they offer. Um, lots of people go there already um, for a lot of different health needs. Um, and so I see that in the future, and um, those types of services that are delivered and offered through, through pharmacy care um, could have quite a potential impact on, on stroke prevention efforts. Okay, well, that's, that again, I guess, uh, reveals to us how the, the extent of, of how many parts of the health system can work together in, in preventing and, and treating stroke. So I just wanted to kind of have a real discussion now with the whole panel about looking at that, like what, looking at the Australian health system, looking at how we handle stroke. Uh, what are we doing well generally, and what are the areas that you think that we uh, stand to improve? I guess I would ask some of you, Brenda. Okay. Um, look, I, I think one of the things we are doing well is um, having national guidelines, stroke foundation guidelines, because those guidelines are, are geared around current research, um, and they provide the clinicians with the best practice of, what, uh, of, of treating people with a stroke and, and ongoing um, care and management. So I think they've, they've made a huge, massive difference. And, and the exciting thing is the Stroke Foundation has just received funding for living guidelines. So instead of waiting five or seven years, these guidelines will, will evolve as research evolves. So that, that's just um, amazing. Stroke units. I still think stroke units are such an important part of stroke care. And the other thing that I've had the opportunity to do, Kate Jackson is here, I saw her over there. Um, I've been involved for many years with um, the State Government Agency for Clinical Innovation and, um, and their stroke network. And so there's a lot of work being done in state stroke networks that people really probably aren't aware of. And the state stroke networks um, are there, that their aim is to, to improve consistency and care across the state. And so whilst there's a lot of things happening nationally, there's a lot of things happening in each of the states. And so I think that's, that's a good thing too. Is there any areas you think that we need to fill in? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Next page, big list. <laughs> Look, I, I, one thing I, I, I think we, we do need to get better at is um, really engaging stroke survivors and carers in the whole process, um, you know, and, and, and making them a part of the, the whole journey. You know, sometimes in, in the emergency department, so much is going on, it's a bit hard to be knowing what's going on, but, but stroke survivors, carers and families need to be engaged as soon as possible, need to be in, involved in the decision-making process, need to be involved in the discharge planning process, 
that's, that's not being done very well at all. Um, we need better resources after discharge. Um, we need more follow-up. Um, and, and access to um, therapies after that magic six months of therapies, you know. People, you know, don't rapidly just get better after six months. They need access to, to um, you know, those therapies. Can you fail to me by that magic six months? Well, you get rehab, and um, in and after six months, really, um, the the system's designed to say, well, look, you know, you, you've had your rehab. See you later. And so there's not a lot out of there in the community. There's a little bit, but not a lot out in the community. So st stroke survivors go home and, and flounder, you know. And and so it's when they get home, they're just left to actually try and manage their life. And um, so there's a lot more needed after after discharge. So um, look, better fast campaign, um, and. As mentioned, knowing people, knowing their risk factors, you know, they. I, I'm working with people who you, I would think would know their risk factors. They don't. It's really quite amazing. Um, and, and the other thing I'd like to see is a better inter-cooperation between hospitals and GPs and community um, health. You know, I think there's a disconnect there. So often GPs have no idea what's going on, really. And, um, and um, yeah, more funding for research, that would be good. Okay, amen. <laughs> 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 I'll put the time to that one. What do you think, Andrew? Um, what, what are the areas that you think Australia is doing well in and, and where do we need to improve? I'd say Australia is actually very good at doing research. Uh, there, there, there are a lot of hospitals with a strong research culture that have proved well into trials and doctors incorporated into their day-to-day -day activities and, and that's very important. Because doing research actually keeps you at the forefront of research and what's been shown and, and how to do it. It makes you a better doc. It's, that's been shown time and time again. Um, this really does have a benefit there by comparison. We're a bit of a small country. We have large hospitals and so there's a few of them. And so then you can sort of get this really good communication between them all and get them all on board in the same programs. Um, so when I wanted to start a trial a few months ago, I just sent off an email to people who I already knew, say, hey, <laughs> can you be in my trial? Yeah, sure, it's done. Um, so that's, that's, I'd say we're very good at research and then adopting new um, new practice. So if there's new therapy that comes on board and it's, it's approved, um, the uptake of that is very quick. And what about, uh, you talked before about, um, so we touched on the notice from the arm here, the arm for a few, um, <coughs> View the imaging from from a remote. Have experts review the imaging remotely. Is that an area you think we need to improve in terms of access to these treatments? Uh, yes, quite significantly. Uh, there are a few programs on the way to do it. Um, so I've been working with the Victorian model at the moment, um, and, and that that works. So that sort of needs to be deployed to every state. Um, South Australia being an, an exception because they've got one hospital. They all come there. <laughs> it's an interesting, interesting model. Okay, Caleb, what do you think? What's, how would you give your report card to Australia? Oh, look, I think I've got a list a little bit in the brain <laughs> and I'm going to do better. But to, to, to begin with, I think acknowledging that Australia is quite advanced in stroke care, we provide fabulous stroke care that's, that's really progressed over the last decade or so. Um, in New South Wales in particular, we have awesome stroke units that provide fantastic care. Um, through multidisciplinary approaches and um, with great patient outcomes. But the thing to bottom line is we can do, do better. Um, and I think that the evidence generation in stroke has, has really boomed in the last decade, probably, um, whereby the science has really progressed in how we're treating stroke. Um, however, um, practice in the health system is lagging behind potentially due to the funding um, and uh, there's re a real need for that to, to really pick its game up to, to um, meet the, the science that we, that we have. Um, one of my areas that I'm quite passionate about and echo Brenda's sentiment is we give really good care in stroke units in the hospital um, and it's, it's great but um, patients need a lot more care once they go home, and it is after they leave the hospital door and they go home, and um, that they 
they need that support. And I think that transitional care phase um, is the area that's really important. There's quite a lot of attention at the moment around about hyperacute management and the, um, the bling that's attracted with the fancy gadgets to pull out clots, which all sounds very cool and is very exciting. Um, but at the end of the day, we only small, treat a small number of patients with drug lysis and thrombectomy. Um, and the majority of patients um, really need, would benefit greatly um, by improved transitional care. And so I think, yes, there's a need to improve our rates of, of thrombolysis and thrombectomy, and that will lead to improved patient outcomes. But that transitional care phase is, is of super importance. And um, access to rehabilitation and support services um, just so that patients don't fall through the net when they go home. And they're at their most vulnerable time. Um, and having someone link in with them um, you know, after a few days, after a week, is of great importance um, to make those referrals and to make sure that they're not falling through, through the net. Um, and so I think that area is, is an area in particular that we do a lot better in. Um, I think the preventative side of it as well, um, so both primary prevention and secondary prevention as well. We, as nurses, we say that we educate the patients about risk factor reduction in the hospital. Is that the best time to do it? Are we using the best resources? Um, and health uh, behaviour change is, is very challenging and complex. It's fine for me to sit here and say, stop smoking, you know, eat a healthy balanced diet and exercise more. Most people in the room know those key messages. And um, actually doing it is, is a hell of a lot more difficult. Um, so really thinking about how we actually achieve behaviour change in the secondary prevention space as well is, is really important. Um, going back to the earlier point about health system we design as well, like the evidence is coming out around um, from back to me is is amazing, and the, the, the need for telemedicine is um, is pressing. And so I think Brenda's point around actively engaging consumers mm -hmm. to really lobby for improvements and a really radical change of the health system and how we deliver that care is really needed. Um, I think when you look at the advancements that's been made in, in say, heart attack and, and cardiovascular disease, you know, now every hospital has a, a cath lab that operates, you know, 24 7, or, you know, a lot, of, there's great access to care. Patients nowadays don't have the huge catastrophic heart attacks that, are, that were seen decades ago. Stroke care is just 20 years behind that. Um, we now need to mandate <laughs> the exact same services. Listening to Sharon's um, opener there around it being the third biggest killer, it's like, I haven't heard that for a little while, and I'm like, hold on a minute, why, why, why are we still having this conversation? Um, it's, it's very frustrating um, when the science is so progressed. There's, there's actually the, the funding mechanisms and the health service redesign for stroke care that really needs to happen. Well, that's uh, kind of a nice lead into my next question, which is going to be about, I guess, looking further ahead into the future. Uh, you know, in the next 20 or so years, where do you see, where would you like us to be, or what do you hope for us to be changes in the way we do with stroke? Okay, I guess one of the exciting things, more exciting thing, I think, is the comprehensive stroke centres and how those can really function as, as hubs of excellence in both research and care and education and really excellent hubs. But I think in those types of models of health systems, often rural and regional miss out. So it's about how we design those centres of excellence, but also tap into the rural and regional areas. I think telemedicine offers a fantastic way of doing that. Um, some of the, the evidence and the stats from the Stroke Foundation really show that the gap in care for, for those that don't live in the um, metropolitan areas and um, on the coastal lines of, of Australia. So having those um, comprehensive stroke centres that really address all of um, the stroke continuum right through from the preventative side of stuff 
um, the treatment and the rehabilitation side and the follow-up care um, is super important. And I think the follow-up care and transitional care stuff, again, provided through those at Centers of Excellence, something that in the future hopefully could be quite exciting. Yeah. How about you, Andrew? Considering on the, the cutting edge of research, what sort of big developments or changes would you hope for in stroke in the next 20 years? 20 years is a long time. Um, so I would say that, yeah, acute medicine is probably done. Um, with the treatment effective rate of thrombectomy and combined with tenacoplase, about 90% of the clots can be removed. Uh, you know, it's pretty close to most of them. So then, Treatment will start to focus into other areas, prevention and rehab after that. Um, and I would say that, yeah, it's going to be a shift in focus of the big research that gets done. Um, and my, my shift is actually to post-stroke, to the post-stroke world. Um, I find doing stroke prevention work, it's, it's a long game. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to attract that kind of long funding and uh, I'm not going to go into it. Um, other than to look at you know baseline stroke mechanisms um, to do some sort of biology and point of care testing, um, but yeah, stroke rehab I'd say will come into the forefront more, and it's a perfect time to get into stroke rehab research because there's, there's very few um, proven uh, interventions at all. And there was a very large physio trial <coughs> recently completed that sort of went the other way; it was harmful. Uh, so there's a lot there's a lot to do from zero. And Brecker, um, can you say that what you've seen as changes in the last, uh, well, since you've had your stroke in the last um, previous decades, what do you think, what do you hope for as, um, as big changes in the developments? Look, I actually agree with both and Andrew, um, and but most definitely about the, um, the need to improve stroke we have. Um, um, that's, that's an area that um, needs more research and more evidence. Um, and, but I'd also like to see into the future um, telemedicine. Um, you know, and telemedicine is going to um, be able to benefit all Australians. Um, and it means that um, when somebody's not necessarily right in the city where they've got a neurologist there 24, you know, 24 hours a day, that they, um, that hospital can call in and directly video link with experts in, in neurological care and that, that doctor can actually see that scan right there and there and make good decisions. So you could potentially be anywhere in Australia and get quite good um, um, neurological um, decisions around what treatment a person who's had a stroke um, um, needs to receive. The, the next thing they need to then is have is the ability to have um, rapid transfer to a hospital who can then um, provide that, that stroke unit of care. Um, the other um, thing that I think will be um, really important moving forward will be the living guidelines. Because research is happening so fast that to keep up with the changes that need to happen so that all the clinicians are on, on the same page, the living guidelines is really the only way that um, clinicians and stuff are going to be able to go, okay, this is the best care that we need to do. So, yeah. I'm just wondering, in terms of, um, you mentioned like telemedicine and the ability to, uh, for the neurologist to see the scans, and I think this quite so what you were talking about, Andrew, with, um, uh, for the, the clock busting treatments, but um, what about tele-rehab as well? Do you think that's going to be a possibility in the future? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's pick up the phone. Have a camera on the other end. Mm -hmm. So you'd have like a, um, a physio or an OT uh, being able to deliver, say, their um, instructions and, and treatment remotely as well. Absolutely. There's, there's very few barriers. So there's actually less barriers to that than there is acute in acute medicine. So in, in acute medicine, you have to deal with hospital IT, which is barbaric. <laughs> And one other question, like, um, if we uh, go to the audience to, to get your questions, one other question we did have, which I know that um, both um, Brenda and Angie are both um, quite passionate about, is uh, some of the hidden disabilities after stroke. In particular, fatigue is something that a lot of strokes and to deal with, uh, and it's perhaps not well understood by uh, other people that they encounter. Um, Brenda, can you give us a bit of an idea of 
the impact of the plague or the awareness of it in the community and yeah. what do you know about what can be done about it? Yeah. Look, stroke fatigue is such uh, an underestimated um, um, issue for stroke survivors. Um, you know, when I, I first had my stroke 17 years ago, um, I, I went to my GP about 18 months down the track saying, look, I, I didn't realise fatigue was going to be such an issue. And he, he said at the time that I was the first person um, with a stroke that had actually even mentioned it to him. And um, so it, it is a totally under-recognised issue. And, and, um, and it's only in probably the last five or six years it's, it's getting more traction now. Um, and um, I keep going back to the guidelines, but um, I was on um, the Guideline Working Party in 2007 and 2010. And in 2010, you know, it, it, um, stroke fatigue finally made it into the guidelines. I was so thrilled. Um, you know, um, it, it needs more um, research to be done about it. But like, it, it's not just about being tired. Um, it, it, uh, stroke fatigue affects my speech, it, it affects my balance and coordination. Uh, the brain fog, you know, at work with fatigue, I, I can't concentrate. Um, and um, I've got a friend when he's fatigued, he will aspirate food, not much more, and he, he falls. So it's, it's, you know, it's not just this simple thing that um, people think goes away in, in 12 months, two years. I'm 17 years down the track. I, I, I still get it. Pretty much almost on a daily basis. So, yeah, so it's big. And as I understand, you're doing some, some research on fatigue yourself. Can you give us an idea of, of what you're doing, but also, I guess, what sort of possibilities are out there for dealing with post stroke fatigue? Sure. Um, the cause of fatigue and stroke, it's, it's really unknown. When you start to look into it, there's, a, there's fatigue in all neurological injuries. So it's probably not stroke specific, it's neurology specific. Um, and on awareness, um, I, only, I only work with neurologists, I don't work with GPs. And um, awareness amongst the neurologists is, of fatigue is, is enormous. Like all of my you know, stroke survivors fatigue, the bug it, but uh, what, what can I do about it? You know, there's no interventions for them. Um, I noticed fatigue in um, patients when uh, I was doing a longitudinal study. I wanted to map brain recovery after stroke, um, one of my failed projects. But um, what was obvious, what was really obvious in these patients is that uh, they just couldn't complete a lot of the cognitive assessments I wanted them to do, and they just really struggled. And um, they all fell asleep in the scanner and all these kinds of things. They were really struggling. Uh, it's it's not a calm environment scanning. Um, it is cold though, so maybe that helps. But um, wh when I um, went back to Newcastle for a, a fellowship, uh, just speaking to one of my uh, bosses at the time, Chris Lee, I was like, yeah, I well, you know, want to do some clinical trials and I think fatigue is a good thing to hit. And he's like, well, I've been thinking the same thing too. We sort of came together and started a, a, a post stroke fatigue trial. It was only out of Newcastle because uh, I was still learning how to do clinical trials at that point. There's a lot of regulations around how to get drugs. Uh, we tested a drug called modafinil, which is a wakefulness promoting agent. It's been around since the 80s, um, and it's very effective, it's very nice, um, and it's very safe. Because it's been around for so long, it's got this really built up safety profile. It can be given to many people with all these cardiovascular risk factors, and you know, it doesn't interact with medications, and it's fantastic. Um, what we found over this, um, this study, it was a complex design, but we gave them the drug for six weeks, and we had uh, of we had 36 patients, and of that, five went back to work who hadn't been to work for over a year. Uh, and what was really impressive with that is that not all people in our trial could actually go back to work. They were either too disabled or they were sort of past working age. Um, so that trial showed very significant reductions in fatigue, improvements in quality of life. People were just getting out and about more, and all the um, Feedback was great. So based on that, we've now started a phase three trial, which is multi-center, we international. Uh, we'll expand the UK uh, pretty soon, maybe next year. Um, and recruitment for this trial started about two months ago, and 
we, we planned it quite well. So we, we knew how to find fatigue patients based off our experience. And um, in two months, we've recruited so many patients. I mean, it's a very rapidly recruiting uh, trial. Because you go to the neurologist and say, we've got a trial for your fatigue patients in your clinic. Enroll them in this. Just tell them there's a 50-50 chance they'll get active drug or placebo. And they just have to accept that. Uh, it's just research, I'm sorry. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's a lot of awareness. Uh, the options don't need to be stroke specific, so you don't need to look at a, a targeted stroke drug, you just generic drugs to do. Um, and very positive or very optimistic this trial will, will go well. We've also had some very good luck. We got a charitable donation from a, a bank to kickstart the study, which was, that was great. And yeah, well, let's hope that if that phase three trial is successful, that doesn't make the um, the living guidelines as yes. as Brett was talking about. Now, look, I think we better uh, give the audience a chance now to ask questions. Now, I'm afraid we don't have a microphone to pass around, so if you have a question, please um, put up your hand and speak loudly, and we'll do our best to to hear your question. Hello, I'm Carly. I'm 40. I've had a stroke on the 14th of June, and this year, and the stroke. Two questions. The first is front line because I presented to. Oh, God, thanks. Yeah. I was about to get that. Um, <laughs> so I just repeat that. Carly, 40, had a stroke on 14 October this year. Um, two questions. The first is I presented to an ED at a large hospital here in Sydney and possibly had a classic experience. I was sent home after a CT that showed hyperdense with an outpatient MRI. So you had a hyperdense vessel sign on your CT? Correct. And they sent you home? Correct. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, this is, it was subsequently investigated and I'm very happy that hospital opened that investigation because when I was on the ward, I went back five days later for my outpatient MRI and was sent straight from the MRI into the UD where I was then in hospital for 10 days. Another young woman, two years older than me, presented same sent home and back a few days later. In the fast, I didn't present within the time frame because I did not know I was stroking, which obviously is a problem for young stroke people because they don't know. Um, but I couldn't speak properly when I presented to EB, and yet I was still sent home. I did not have physical deficits at the time. They presented about three or four days later, also common. Um, when I was sent home, the ED were very clear with me that there was something on my CT that had to be investigated. And given my age, it's probably MS or vasculitis or something like that. And I asked a series of questions and they were well received, but I did not receive any neuroconsult in the ED when I presented. And when I was subsequently admitted, the neuro team that I worked with, who were wonderful on the stroke ward, couldn't believe that I had no neuroconsult given how I presented. So the first thing is emergency departments. For young, I'm not old, I'm very healthy. How do we prevent this happening? Because I was outside of the drug window, but I certainly should have been hospitalised given my chance of stroking again. And then the second thing is, and I'm very fortunate by the way because I'm making very good recovery, um, but the second thing is when I was on the ward and I was young, articulate, able to speak, able to communicate, and the majority of people on the board around me are much older and unable to advocate for themselves. When their family members were not there and no one could speak on their behalf, there was no resource for them on the board. And I spent 10 days walking around the board helping elderly people communicate because they couldn't. And there was no social services resource, there was no psychiatrist, there was no psychologist. The nurses did the best they could to advocate, but of course they're dealing with patients coming in every few hours and requiring the drugs and, and all that emergency treatment. So the first is emergency rooms for non-typical stroke present, presentation and how to deal with that. And the second is how do we advocate for people who cannot communicate and ask the questions that they need to ask. Yeah. And should you like to talk about the emergency room presentation? Well, yeah, the ED story, uh, it's, it's not necessarily uncommon, yeah. unfortunately. Um, and there has been a very long history of 
uh, conflict between neurologists and ED physicians over the effectiveness of the, the drug, so all the place. Uh, ED physicians were for a very long time saying it's only harmful, it does no benefit, it's bad. And neurologists are saying, of course it's good, you know, there's a chance the patient will have a big recovery. And the reality is they're both right. Uh, and that's really why we do imaging, because it, when you do imaging and you know exactly what's in front of you, you can actually see the perspectives. So ED see a lot of mimics, a lot of mimics. In fact, the vast overwhelming majority of you know, their suspected strokes would definitely be a mimic. So our migraine can be a mimic, um, and that's, that's quite a common presentation for first migraine, for example. Um, and so their job to pull all that apart is, is very challenging. And so they do need a cultural shift or referral. If there's neurological symptoms, send them to the, uh, to the neuro team. But they also need to sort of get over this anti-thrombolysis culture. Um, and the reason they would say that thrombolysis was harmful um, is because there is a 1 in 20 chance that it causes a major hemorrhage. And that's catastrophic, probably killing the patient. Um, and you can prevent that by withholding treatment from patients who are at very high risk of that, and you can tell that by imaging. So that's sort of, the imaging is sort of the common ground there to try and bridge that gap. Um, does that make sense? Yes? Uh, yeah? yeah. Uh, and a big part there as well is if you treat, if you treat a mimic who you think is a stroke with thrombolysis, they do well. If you don't treat them, they do well. So that would be why any person would say, look, you know, thrombolysis doesn't work. It's based on their experience. Uh, and then a neurologist would typically see the worst patients and so treat them and there's a higher chance that they'll be better. So it's, it's, very, it, it's, it's a big challenge. Um, and there, there does need to always be a local process of referral or you know, what assessments you want to be doing um, for there to be a large, for, for there to be a hyperdense artery in the discharge. That's that's much worse than that. I mean, that's 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 ridiculous. Um, but that's also the point of <laughs> that's also the point of uh, telehealth as well. Um, recent, so I, I sit in front of the uh, Victorian Stroke. Um, telling their work and I see all the images coming through because I'm just making sure the computer doesn't crash basically. Uh, so I see all the scans that come through and there's this one that was just classic patients like, oh that's such a good one. So they're going to be coming here in about two hours for sure. Um, and then I was going to have lunch with my boss 15 minutes later. So when's that patient going to come? You know, more of the big, big clot. Uh, they had missed it. Uh, so we called them up. You've got to bring them in. Um, and that was because the radi radiologist just, he didn't see the clock. It was in a strange location, but the other imaging told us it was definitely there. So you've got to be very comprehensive as well. Uh, so it's about making the, the data you give that ED physician from an imaging perspective clear as hell, uh, because it can be very difficult to interpret. And that's sort of some of the work I'm trying to do at the moment is to simplify it, uh, to make these decisions a lot easier for these people to make. Um, so, yeah, does that help answer some? Yeah, what? they should have been in your console. Yeah, they and should have the been. The hospital obviously looked into that side. Yes, yeah. But, but what about... Um, if not even referred by, the, by radiology. It wasn't looking at that. Yeah. No, sorry. Um, the, the question about advocating for people who cannot... Yeah, I, that was a question, yeah, it's about people, uh, the advocacy of our patients on the, on the stroke ward themselves. Um, I think it's probably a good one for um, Caleb and Brenda with your nursing experience. I might just hand the microphone over to Caleb because it's both recorded. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Yeah. I think, think around some, some of the advocacy, also linked to decision making, I can talk about it as well, around the need for greater uh, support tools, practical tools to use in clinical practice. Um, is, is, is urgent, um, but then also um, some of the services that are provided out of hours in hospitals. So um, it's great that we have multidisciplinary stroke units that have a speechy and OT, uh, you know, social worker and so on. Um, but after five o'clock, um, they all go home, and uh, it is the nurses that are, are left to pick up some bits and pieces. Um, and so having you know, those support services potentially available on the weekends as well um, would be quite exciting. Um, and to support patients better. I think the, the, the stuff around um, communication and the tools to support our communication 
there's, there's quite a bit of, of research happening in Australia as well at the moment um, around that, but also tools to support better decision making as well. So communicating with patients around about um, prognostication or expected outcomes. So the questions around about you know, will I walk again, will I my speech get better, you know, those, those sorts of questions. And um, we also need better tools to, to be able to predict outcome um, a bit better and um, better ways of communicating that uh, with patients and engaging with patients because I think all too often um, it's not a, a whole of team approach that really has the patient at the centre and, and things have shifted in healthcare where it's no longer doctor knows best it's very about the expert patient and taking a patient-centered approach. So it's really, the, the core of it is really around the communication with the patient um, and understanding what's important to them and to elicit um, what decisions they, and choices, <coughs> what decisions they make for, for the choices that they have. Um, some of the risk uh, information that we present as well for different treatment options around about um, risks and benefits, supporting patients to with, be provided with that information in a really user-friendly format and have the opportunity to discuss that with healthcare professionals is really important um, and having it in a format that's understandable to people potentially with quite complex disability at the time. Um, you know, health literacy, is, there's a real need to improve, improve that but a lot of time these conversations with patients are really challenging for both consumers and clinicians, but lengthy and, and take a long time in practice. And so if you've got a six minute consult with the doctor, sometimes that's not really the right the, the time or the person also to delivering that communication. So I think there's a lot of reform needs to happen around the, the communication aspect um, with patients and how they're presented with complex treatment decisions. Yeah. Um, I'm right up, sorry about that. Um, look, I think you've raised a, a really important point there. Um, I, um, I think in the first instance it's actually about finding out, because everyone's ability to communicate is, is different. I, I know mine was very affected and I was relying on my family to, uh, to, to communicate for me. Um, I had the attention span of a gnat, you know, I, I couldn't absorb any information and so, and again I was really lucky, my sister's a doctor so she was able to do all that navigating for me, um, but I, I think in the first instance it, it's actually um, establishing um, what the best way for a, a person to be able to, to be able to communicate because there's so many different ways that a person can be supported. And, um, but unfortunately, I think largely, it comes down to the family members. And so if a person doesn't have family members who are able to do that for them, um, that it, it does just fall through the cracks. And I mean, I, I know, um, I mean, my mum wasn't a stroke survivor, but when my mum was in hospital, um, had I not slept beside her bed and advocated for her um, in the middle of the night, um, the, the, the treatment that was distressing her would have continued. And I just went, no, 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 this is stopping. She now needs to have this treatment I be. But had I not been there to say that, um, you know, it, uh, so I just, um, but there's, there is um, more and more hospitals do have carer support units and often the public don't even know that there's a carer support unit actually based within the grounds of their hospital and it's an area where a carer can go take time out, talk to someone, get support and support to help advocate for the person that they've got in hospital. And, um, and, and if a hospital doesn't have a care support unit, they should. You know, they're, they're, they're wonderful places. So um, it, it's, it's a really complex problem. Yeah.
that I meant to think, uh, move my students also is something that does. Um, that's why I was very angry when I heard about all this research. But when I had a stroke two years ago, I knew it was coming the moment I felt a complete sensation in my arm. So um, I called the Indian straight away. Called, cost on my neighbor and the GP to be for me that we probably got to do a because I had actual operation. So um, ambulance came in and then I had a stroke. The idea of a long ambulance came. By the time I think I got into emergencies about five because they had to do a lot of, they asked a lot of questions like putting on arms and stuff and they had to do. I don't know if I can do anything. Um, so in the emergency I had to wait for quite a long time. And uh, even after inside the emergency ward, I didn't see any doctor. Only I forgot that I haven't been in the hospital before. Even though I have seen cardiologists and reviews for the past 30 years. So they had only one hospital assistant who come but once in a while, quite a long while, they said, Are oh, you going to go? No. And then I did. Until when I was hungry, I had to ask the pastor guys, they asked them to help me ask for that as some food. Mm -hmm. And it was a night of thought that they did come and say, Do you have some? Uh, the actual division, do you know what it is about? I said, yeah, that's what I thought. Then only they do the CT, and CT they found nothing. So I don't know after how long, anyway, I just know that. Then I, they said, oh, we are lucky, we have got a, a, a room for you. Not actually a room, it's a shared ward. So I was up there, I didn't know who was my doctor, who was my specialist, even though I had the top, top one cover. So uh, it was until the second day, I think the next day, first day. And then, uh, I can't remember her name, so then, just walking fast. And she just said, oh, okay, please get my boyfriend to fall and fall and sleep. And, um, yeah, I'm saying we request her for MRI, but Friday we miss it. We can't even do it, so I was in the boat for five days for nothing, just waiting until Monday, the lunch time. And suddenly they rushed me because they need a bed. Rushed me for MRI, found that there was a small curl the back. And after that, I, I was waiting for more information. But the next thing I know is the wheelchair was there waiting for me and someone came with one of the nurse, dumped me all my thing in a big plastic bag. I said, I need to call my husband. They discharged me. So I was quite angry because I said, you're taking me like that to tea. You know, just pushing me down. That's it. That's my expression of the Okay, thank you. Do you have anyone have any comments on? I think your point there around uh, the transition out of hospital, like, I think the story that you just told around the big plastic bag and the wheelchair arriving, uh, to me that's not an unfamiliar uh, story in, in, in context. Um, and it's a really disappointing one of how badly uh, what process that we would call discharge planning is mm -hmm. done. That it, I think it's quite reflective of the challenges on the healthcare system to manage beds, essentially. Yeah. Talking um, about the aftercare and everything. Um, that's why I was very lost. I couldn't drive. Mm -hmm. And my husband worked. And my children are obviously elsewhere. So I had to contact to one of the church members daughter to find out who is the occupation artist. And she gave me a number because she said, don't tell me I give this number to yeah. And good thing I, I was given the brochures up to the church and get the support. And I think that, that process around the discharge planning and the transition of how you go from 
hospital to home is certainly an area that a lot of patients um, identify as a need that we really need to improve. And there needs to be, I think, a lot more research in that area as well. It's not done very well at all. Awesome. Okay, I think we have, we're running out of time. We're going to take quite a while. I think we have time for one more question. Is that right? Yeah. There are lots of foundations in our country, I, I can only think of two at the moment, um, but there are many, and one being the McGrath Foundation, the Fred Hollows Foundation. We all have a good foundation. Yeah. Oh. Foundation. Yeah. Uh, that's right, I can't think of more at the moment. Okay, sorry. Um, what does the Stroke Foundation actually do? Okay, I think this is a question for Andrew, Brenda, and Caleb, who both uh, speak on behalf of the Stroke Foundation. Well, Brenda has been a um, and really the yeah. Stroke Foundation. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, um, look, I um, first started becoming involved with the Stroke Foundation um, quite, a, quite a, I would think probably about um, a decade ago, um, 2007, yeah, a decade ago. Um, and uh, it, it was, as I said, I think the Stroke Foundation was um, gaining more um, public awareness, people were learning about them, um, and, and that was when um, I, I went on board to um, uh, review one of their guidelines. And so that was probably my, my first um, um, way of getting to know them. And, and what they provide, there's a, uh, a 1800 number that anybody from around Australia can ring and say, I've got um, a problem, I don't know where to go, I don't know who to talk to. And there's really um, a, a good people with a lot of knowledge that they can provide a stroke survivor or carer information where they could go. So that's one, one thing the Stroke Foundation do. They have a website where you can go to them and if you can navigate websites, I sometimes can't, but there's information there. And then there's also a thing called Enable Me, and it's for stroke survivors. If, again, if they're interested in going online, it's a way of getting a lot of information. But what they do is they, they've got offices in Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, around the country. So they're there to... Um, raise awareness, they do a lot of advocacy with um, government about getting more funding for, for stroke. Um, stroke, I mean, I know because I've been involved, stroke was um, seen by the federal government as a national priority 20 years ago. It has never had any um, um, federal government funding. So they advocate constantly to improve services so that stroke survivors um, can have a bit, better chance. So, um, is there more to do? Absolutely. But, but they really are out there driving, um, and, and it's also their guidelines. Their guidelines drive the best practice care that clinicians provide to stroke survivors. So without those guidelines, people would be doing all sorts of different stuff. But they, because of the guidelines, they know that this is the way, the best way to provide care. So, would that be... Yeah, I think that's a good summary, Brenda. Yeah. But I think, yeah. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. I related very much to what you said about um, post-discharge and being left out there floundering in the community. Yeah. Um, I can certainly relate to that. Yeah. Um, it, can the Stroke Foundation get involved in uh, advocating for social workers who specialise in stroke discharge patients and uh, and ensure that all the things we've talked about here today happen. We keep hearing, we've got to do this, we've got to do that, this has to happen, that has to happen. But it's not happening. It isn't happening in, in all places. In some places it does happen better, in other places it doesn't happen. What the Stroke Foundation do is um, they, um, they advocate very, very strongly with both um, the federal government and state governments about the need for better discharge planning and um, 
And then what they do is they do a survey of hospitals every few years. Um, and, and whilst it's, uh, you may not know about it, but that survey information shows that discharge planning generally is done very badly. Mm -hmm. So then it gives them the opportunity to say, okay, this is an area we have to focus on and it has to be done better. But it means government coming on board as well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we have a bit of time now, so I want to thank you all again for coming here today and uh, listen to this talk and I hope you have come away with better knowledge of what's going on in stroke care and what the hospitals are for the future, but also that you'll go away remembering the, the fast message and the, and the tips for a healthy life. Um, I'd like to now join me in thanking our panellists for today. Uh, we have a very good And yes, I believe stroke, stroke group runs until Sunday. I think the 9th of September, so maybe there's a couple of, couple of days left to get out there and find some events around you. So thanks again for coming.